Oh yeah. All right. Yeah, I do that one. Wait, oh, back of your heads are being recorded. I'm just gonna see if this works. I don't know if this works. We'll give it a shot, huh? I don't know where it's gonna save it. I got it saved to some arbitrary place, but that's okay. We'll see how this works out. Yes, you have to either use the location or so today we're gonna to, we're gonna do a whole bunch of example problems. So get your computer out, your notepad out, whatever. I'm gonna ask you guys to do some work, gonna play some cool jazz music while you're working, and it will do it that way. Okay. So and then so I'll propose a problem. I'll make sure you understand it, you'll give it a shot. And then I'll play some jazz music while you're working, and then I will come back and show you my solution. Which doesn't necessarily mean it's the right solution, it just means it's my solution. Now I'm really confused because what I'm seeing over here has nothing to do. Okay, that's just crazy. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay, so we did, we started some of this uh, the other day. Before I do that, I want to go over, so over here. in there that says uh, iteration helpful techniques. So what you're probably going through right now if you're new to coding is that you know you're getting your feet under you and you can feel like you can write a function and that's cool. Right. But now you realize the problems are getting a little bit harder and it's like okay how do I start? How do I begin to dissect what I'm being asked? Uh, and you'll see that today because the problems I'm showing you today are coming at you from a lot of different angles. So there's some helpful techniques. You remember when I talked about the whole psych psychology thing about chunking, how the difference between a chess novice and a chess master uh, is not in the fact that they're both human and humans, psychology tells us that humans can uh, retain seven plus or minus two items at one time in their head. Um, and so the chess beginner, the chess novice, the chess master, they both are retaining seven plus or minus two things in their head. Just like when we approach coding, the, ch the coding novice and the coding expert, they both can only retain seven plus or minus two things in their head. But what the difference is, is that the size of the chunks that a master or a somebody who's experienced has are larger than that of a novice. In other words, in chess, a novice is just looking at the board trying to figure out how to move the pawn forward one space or two spaces if it's in the first square. And what does this thing do? It moves diagonally. And my God, I still can't figure out how the knight moves. All right. Uh, whereas a master is seeing this board and the next five boards ahead. All right. So that's the difference when you start coding is You've got to be able to get these big chunks in your head so that the problem is not as difficult as you think it is, right? 
And honestly, when we write these problems, we write them with these chunks in mind, right? We say to ourselves, well, they should be able to traverse an array. Well, they should be able to use linear indexing here. Well, they should be able to sort the array. Well, they should be able to go down this string four characters at a time and figure out what's going on, right? So, uh, so let's look at this. And in terms of conditionals, the if and the switch, and iterations, the for and the while, right? What the if and the switch allow you to do is select data. And it is very much akin to masking. There are times when using one or the other is perfectly fine. Right? Masking tends to be a bit faster. Masking is also sort of the, not exclusive, but MATLAB uses masking much more than other languages do. In fact, I've never used masking in any other language than MATLAB. Um, it's a feature of the language. Um, but all of that allows you to select the data you want. The looping. The iterations, the for and the while, allow you to get to the data, right? They allow you to traverse the data, go down a string, right? Go through an array, right? They allow you to go through your data. And then when you get to it, you use the conditionals, the if and the switch, to select, or masking, to select the data. Right? Now, masking allows you to usually select data without having to iterate through it, right? You just do it all at once. Boom. So that's the difference. Masking, you usually don't need to use iterations because you're just doing the whole thing at once. Whereas uh, using conditionals, you usually have to use the loops to get you to the data and then make a decision. Okay, so it's getting to the data and then selecting the data. Right? So that's sort of the strategies we have. So when you look at these problems, look at them and say, okay, what's the data look like? What's the structure like? How do I get to what I want? And when I get there, how do I get through the data? And how do I choose what I want? And then when I get what I want, then what do I do with it? Multiply it by two, divide it by six, add a Z on the end of it, I don't know, whatever. Okay. All right, so uh, here are some helpful techniques when it comes to, and this is in a file that's out there for you guys, it's called Iteration Helpful Techniques. Um, okay. I did not clean my glasses after workout this morning because I was busy and I have sweat spots on my glasses. So if I start pointing to the wrong thing, forgive me. Um, I, I, I can clean it. All right, so one technique, moving down a string. We saw this uh, on Tuesday. Using loops to move down a string. So somebody gives you a vector of characters, and you've got to move down this thing, right? Now keep in mind, MATLAB sees it as a vector of characters. You may see it as words, right? It depends on how the data is arranged, right? One of these problems we're going to use is going to be in couplets. You're going to have um, product ID number, comma, product price, space, product ID number, comma, product price, right? So you got to know how your data is formatted. Right? So this one is it. But MATLAB views it as a vector of characters, right? And then you as a human have to impose some order here, right? So now, here's a typical thing we do. While the string is not empty, that's what this says, is empty checks to see if the string is empty. While it's not empty, this is not is empty. So this says while the string is not empty, okay? We did this the other day. Do this move here. String token is your friend. String token, what does it do? Let's go back, right? String token takes the string and splits it into two things. It cuts it at the delimiter. The delimiter is what follows the co comma here, right? So in this case, the delimiter is a space, right? The default delimiter is the space. So if that's not here, if this is just a parenthesis here, then the delimiter is a space. Okay, so that's the default. Uh, I was being very explicit here. Uh, so. What this does is it's going to split this string into two pieces. It's going to cut right before the delimiter, the first delimiter, right? And the first thing, the thing to the left is going to cut between the E and the space. The thing to the left goes into this first value here, which I usually call token. I call it a token because word is sort of not right. What goes in here is the delimiter, this space, and the rest of the string, right? So that's what goes in here. 
Now, by putting this in a loop, what happens is I can pull off the first thing, right? And then have the rest of it. Then I can inspect the first thing. So you talk about getting to the data. This is how you get to the first thing in each first thing. This is how you get down the string, pulling off one token at a time. Because when this comes back up here, the fact that I assigned the rest back to the variable string, now I come back up here and now string is this part. It starts with the space and goes there. Right? I come here, remember string token will take, it will ignore any leading delimiters, right? So then the first thing now will be bus, and then the rest of the string is now from here over, right? So every time through, I'm taking the first thing off, right? And coming back with the rest of it. And I keep doing that, and eventually I'll run out of stuff, and it will be empty, and this string will terminate. Common strategy. Somebody gives you a string of stuff and asks you to find something or do something with it, right? That's beyond the capabilities of stir find or stir repeat or whatever. Then now you have a way to get down and to work. This is my, I call this the Pac-Man strategy. Then you're like, you're, just, you're gobbling up the string as you go down. Whatever. It works for me. I like to keep it simple. All right. So that's one technique, moving down a string. Same thing, different token. I mean, different delimiter, that's all. Another thing we do a lot of is accumulate a total, right? But as we're going down something, as we're analyzing something, we're counting how many things we have, right? How many times we find something that is of our liking or that is called upon by the algorithm for us to take note of, right? So here, we're gonna count the number of vowels, count the number of consonants, right? Now this time, um, so this time I'm going to do it with a for loop, right? Which is fair enough, right? I know how many things are here. See, before, I didn't necessarily know how many tokens were in the string, right? I didn't know, I could count the number of spaces and do it that way. But since I don't need to do that, I just sort of went down one token at a time. Here, since I'm going to address every character, I know exactly how many characters are in the string. You see the difference? Right. Knowing how many tokens are in a string, you may or may not know because you don't know how many spaces are there. But I know exactly how many characters in a string. It's just the length of the string. Right. All right. So here, I'm going to. My strategy is I'm going to visit every character, determine if it's a vowel. If it is, I count it as I add one to my vowel counter. Right. If it's a consonant, or if it's not a vowel, assuming, well, assuming that it's not a space or can't see, so I have to deal with punctuations and spaces and all that crap. So I got to deal with that. So usually in these kind of problems, it's okay, I'm going down this string. What do I have to pay attention to? I have to pay attention to the vowels. I have to pay attention to the constants. The constants. Every time I get to a vowel, I increment my vowel count. Every time I get to a consonant, I increment my consonant count. If it's not one of those, yeah. Well, that sounds like an if statement. So I want to use my for loop. All right. And now, this is even clever. This is a little bit more cleverer, if you will, right? What I need to do is check each character. Well, this is a vector of characters. So I make my string my loop vector. Every time through the, the string, I'm going to yank off the first, the next character of, every time through the loop, I'm going to yank off the next character of the string, right? You see how I'm using the for loop to get me the data that I want. These are subtleties. This is why I have to go over them. This is why the, close, the, the course sort of opens up after this because you can do so many different things. All right, so let's look at this. Here I displayed the character. I just did that for fun. Um, and then here is my if statement. This is I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to go down each character in the string, and then I'll make a decision. If this is my definition for vowel, I ignored Y, right? This is <laughs> I mean, I've done this a long time. I've never, I just ignore why, because when are you going to determine if Y is a vowel? What's the algorithm for determining if Y is a vowel or a consonant? They never told us that. They just said, and sometimes Y, and left it at that, right? You got to figure that shit out on your own. That's the English language for you. There are no consistencies at all. Right? Uh, what happens when you take a whole bunch of cultures and put them together and come up with a language? All right. Uh, so, 
Here, this is my definition to find a vowel. We've done that many times before, right? So if either one of these is true, you see the or statement working for me. Could have done an any here. I decided to just do a whole bunch of ors. Right? Uh, if any one of these are true, I found a vowel. So I increment my vowel counter by one. You understand how this is an increment, right? You take what's stored in vowel count, you add one to it, then put it in, then replace what was in vowel count with the new number. Right. So I'm incrementing every time. That's why I have to start with zero. So here we go. Else, if it's not space, then it's a consonant. Now, what does this imply? It implies a couple of things, right? It implies that the string is all lowercase because this wouldn't find capital vowels, right? Or at least all the vowels are lowercase, right? It also implies there's nothing else in there but characters and spaces. So this problem could get more complex if I remove some of the safeguards. If I can give you just any old string, now you got to check to make sure it's uppercase, or you take the whole thing lowercase, mask out all everything that's not a character first, clean the data before you get to this loop. Does that make sense? Which is usually a good strategy. If you're allowed to clean it, clean it beforehand. But if you need to retain the capital letters and whatsoever, then it's then it's not as easy just to make everything lowercase. You see my point? So you have to be cognizant of what you're being asked to do. So in this case, it's just a, it's a string. We're going to assume that everything's lowercase and there's nothing else in there but uh, lowercase letters, uh, spaces, and then we're good. Right? If there were punctuations, we'd have to do some things. Right? Masking is great for cleaning strings, for cleaning stuff, because it does it all at once. Right? You get rid of all the punctuations, keep the characters, and this roll on. All right, so, but you've been through those drills before. Right? There's method to our madness. You've been through that stuff. Okay, are there any questions? Or am I going entirely too fast? I feel like I'm talking fast. I don't know if it's the coffee because it's really good. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. So, when you have like your for statement with x equals string, is that not just equal to the whole string? No, and there is the key to understanding the for statement. All right. When you put it in a for statement, yes, everything you've been taught is I just assigned this entire string to the value X, right? And that would be true if we were not in a for statement, in a for loop. The for loop forces X to become each successive value in the string every time we go through the loop. That is how it is designed. That's what it's made to do. That's the magic of a for loop. That's the big deal. Other languages, for loops look a little bit different, but let's just stay with this reference. And I spent four hours yesterday programming in JavaScript, so if I mess something, if I say something incorrect, please, if I start indexing at zero, please, check, please check me. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions about this? This is like recitation during lecture, so ask questions, please. Everybody got this? Am I that good of a teacher or y'all just don't want to talk to me? Or are you still just mesmerized by my cool Starbucks cup? Starbucks cup. It's my, it's my, this is, this is some bourgeois shit, right? So Saturday and Sunday mornings, my wife, my dog and I, we live, we live a half mile, no, actually we live about a quarter of a mile from the Belmont, right? We live about a half mile from Pond City Market. So there's a Kroger at Pond City Market. It used to be called Killer Kroger. Bad, bad gnome, bad name, but some, unfortunately, some people did lose their lives at that Kroger over the years. Well, it was 30 years old, then they decided to renovate it, so they did, and now it's all new. And there's a patio. Have y'all been to this Kroger? There's a patio. There's, yeah, there's a patio that's on the belt line, and there's a Starbucks and a bar there. The bar's not usually open on Saturday and Sunday morning, but the patio is, right, and the Starbucks is. So we walk over there. And my dog gets his two two helpings of egg bites. He's a really bougie dog, right? Gets his two helpings of egg bites. I get my black coffee, and my wife gets some frappuccino thing. And we sit there and watch people on the belt. Line. This is what I do. This is my life, right? I love it. Except for now, we have to walk early and earlier because we can't be out after ten o'clock because shit, it's just too damn hot. The dog's paws get all hot and all that stuff. It's not cool. But anyhow. Uh, you too will live such a lifestyle. Maybe you live it now, I don't know. 
That would be a hell of a college lifestyle. I think I might want to retire and go like teach at some community college near a beach. <laughs> right? And be that professor who comes to work in flip flops and shorts every day. Right? Teach computer science and then walk away. Recitation held on the beach. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, I don't know how I got to that from this, but is everybody okay with this? So we accumulate totals. So we traverse things, we accumulate totals. Then also, there are times when we go down something, we'll concatenate, we'll build a string, we'll build some output as we go, right? We'll build whatever our report is as we go, right? And so, so here, what we're going to do, what is this? This is this, this, what am I doing here? Uh, okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to build, we're going to look at this string and we're going to extract the names from this string. Here are the names identified as anything starting with a capital letter. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is look at each token, see if it starts with a capital letter. If it does, we're going to add it to our output list, which is nothing more than a vector of characters. Right. So we're going to have to put space between them to make sure that we can see. All right. So I'll start off with my string. My output list is empty. Right? This is just like saying when I did the num count starting with zero. Right? Got to start with an empty vessel and then I'm going to put things in it. Right? So as I go down, see this again, that's our good old string token move here, You're putting string back here to the rest. You don't usually have, you don't have to do this, but for this, me, you don't have to do this when you use string token, but if you're going to traverse a vector of characters. This is this, this is what this is the move you make here. So now I check to see. I'm going to pull off each token. I'm going to check to see if the first character in the token is a capital letter. Well, that's what this does, right? It's got to be greater than or equal to A and less than or equal to Z. Okay. If this is true, then concatenate it on to the end of our name list. Well, the first time we do this, name list is empty. So the first token we put in is going to have a space in front of it, then it's going to have the token, right? Now, this is a, a little subtlety here. If we ask you for the answer without the space, the leading space, then all you do is delete it later on, right? It's always easy to find the first leading space. It's always the first character in your output string. Right? So, so here, every time through, if the token starts with a capital letter, this is my capital letter check, I concatenate it onto the end of my name list, right? Always putting a space between them that way. It looks neat when we when we finish. Understanding that I had a space before my first one. So therefore, when I'm finished going through the whole thing, my, I've gotten to the end of my list, then I remove the leading space. That's what this line does here. First thing in my name list, it's going to be a space because I put it there. I'm going to get rid of it. Now my name list is cool. And then I can output it any way I want to. So I made a nice little, I use my SPRINTF. The names are, um, hold the space for a character here. I'm just going to, uh, yeah, yeah, hold the space for characters here and give it the name list and it will print, print that out. Does that make sense? Make sense? If you understand it, you're sitting there like, yeah, okay, I sort of get it. Then it's just a matter of repetition. It's just a matter of using it, right? Um, and I say just, uh, it's, it's not true. It's like, you know, when your coach says, it's just a matter of, you know, you doing 15 gassers, that's all. So the empty bracket in the top just makes me back there for that. So what? Empty brackets in the top, uh, name list. Yeah, it just, it just makes an empty vector. And then I need to start off empty because the first time here, I don't want to, I don't, it's just like when I'm accumulating the total, right? Yeah. I got to start off with an empty container. So this is the equivalent of an empty string container. It just got nothing in it with the name list in the uh, huh? second one. Why? Here? Yeah, to the right. That one. Yeah. yeah. So the first time I come through here, right, this is empty. Okay. So you've got nothing with a space and then a token. I see. Okay. Right? And then every other time, this has whatever it became from the from the previous time. It keeps building. Why do you why do you need this space thing? 
I need a space so when the second time through, when I add something onto the end of it, there'll be a space between each one, right? That's why the space is there. So yeah, let's look at this. Um, this this will be worthwhile going through. Let's uh, let me hit the, put the break points in here. Uh, yeah. All right. So there's my original string. I start off with my name list is empty. I come in. Does that make sense? I got my token. Right. My delimiter is the space here because it's the fault. Then my rest of my string is space and then the rest of the string. Right? And then this is the rest of it. So that's, you cut it here. So I got that as a string and that is out. Then I check to see if the first thing in token, the first character in token is a capital letter. That's what that does. It is not in this case. So I skip that if statement. So you see, I jumped down here. Did not do that. Right. And then now the next thing to do is to go back up to the top to check to see if the string is empty. The string is not empty, so now I extract the next token. So remember, leading spaces get ignored. So now my next token is Harry, right? And then the rest is that. Notice this is getting smaller by a token each time. So now I check to see if this is my token, is the first letter in that or first character in there uh, between A and Z inclusive? Yes, it is. So now I'm going to enter my if statement. See how my if state is making the selection and my for loop, my while loop is taking me to each piece of data, right? So I check it. So now I'm going to add it to my list, right? So remember, at this point in time, name list is empty. Right. So this is going to be empty, concatenated with a space, concatenated with the value of token, which right now is Harry. Right. So when I run that, my name list now becomes space Harry. Which is okay, because as we said, we can deal with that later. So now I go back up to my loop to check if my string is empty. It is not. So I get the next token. The next token is lowercase bus. So I will bypass my ifs. They meant lines 42, 43, and 44, and then come back up to check to see if my string is empty. It is not. So I pull off the first token, which is Ida. Right? And so that is going to pass the test on line 42. So now I can catenate Ida to my list. So I have my own main list, which at this point in time is space Harry. I'm going to concatenate onto the end of that space and then what's in token, which is now Ida, right? So I do that and I get space Harry, space Ida. So that's where I am right now. So let's go back up again, right, because my string is not empty, pull off the next token. The next token is lowercase car. So I fail the test on line 42. So I skip all the way down, go back up, check to see if my string is empty. It is not. So therefore, uh, I pull off the next token. The next token is Julie, right? And then my string now is empty. So I'm going to finish processing here. So the first letter in Julie is, uh, passes the test on line 42. So I concatenate Julie. So I, now I have name list, which was space Harry space Ida. That's going to get space, then Julie added onto it, concatenated onto it. So I do that. And now my name list is that, right? Now I go back up to the top to check to see if my string is empty, and it is. So the loop terminates, and I come out of that, and now I execute line 46, right? Line 46 deals with the fact that I got this space in front of Harry. If I don't want, I, if I want it, then it's okay. But if I don't want it, so I'm gonna get rid of it. So I go to the first character in name list and set it equal to the empty, and everything shifts down one. Right. So now name list is equal to that because I got rid of the first space on line 46 thing. Right. Then I make my output string here. And there you go. Would you um, theoretically take the space before? They got the space before uh, person S. Can I do what? 
Could I take, yeah, I, yeah. So I could have, that would have been interesting. If I left this space in here, if I didn't execute line 46 and just move this percent S over, then it would have worked the same. Right, different way to do the same thing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's the dot the slash n4 the dot is the period in this sentence okay. and slash n is the new line character that takes this over here you notice this yeah. this quote is on a new line because of that okay. if i take that out right if i take this out then this quote won't be there it will be here because i did not insert a new line character does that make sense that's that's the sprint f sprint the the sprint the s print f working. Uh, so yeah, so I take these out. Let's stop this. All right, all right. And now run this. Oh, that's wrong. So now you see my out string doesn't have doesn't have that care that end of line character there. So this quote is here. Remember, end of line, these backslash characters, backslash T, backslash N, they're like the wind, right? You can't see them, but you can see their effect. Okay, everybody okay? Technically, I guess, in a tornado or a dust storm, you can't see, but you know, you still don't see the wind, you see the effect of it, to be completely scientific. All right, all right, so now, so everybody okay with that? Let's, let's summarize here. Talked about how we use loops to move down string. We talked about string token, which is very helpful in doing that. We talked about how we can accumulate totals. Um, we talked about concatenating a string. So now let's talk about this next concept, which is really important. It's called nested loops. It's loops within loops. Loops. Now. You can nest loops as deeply as you want to. You can have loops within loops within loops within loops. Right? And you can have loops within conditionals within loops within conditionals within conditionals within loops, depending on your algorithm, right? Which may seem confusing to you as somebody who's trying to get a good grade in a class. But as an engineer or scientist, it should excite you because it means that you can model real world algorithms. You have the complexity necessary to model real world algorithms. Right? And that's what's cool about it. So once you master this stuff, you have the ability to uh, think about the world uh, in a different way, or at least have a computer to look at the world in a different way. All right, so let's start off with our nested loops here. So I have, nested loops are great for arrays. Because what it simply means is this. I want to keep track of the row. Right? So let's say I want to be on row one. And then I want to go across each column. So I'm going to hold steady at row one. And then I'm going to do columns. Let's start this. One. I'm going to hold steady at row one. And then I'm going to do columns one, two, three, and four. Right? Then I want to change my row value to row two. And then I want to go back again and do columns one, two, three, and four. Then I want to change my row value to row three. Then I want to do columns one, two, three, and four. Then I want to change my row value to row four, and then columns one, two, three, and four. So the loop that's keeping track of my rows is what we call the outer loop. Right? The loop inside of that that's running down the columns is called the inner loop. Right? So I keep track of the rows with one loop. And then I run down each column with the other. And likewise, I could flip this and make the columns my outer loop. So stay in row one, go to columns one, two, three, and four. Now shift to column two. Damn, I said that all wrong. Sorry, back up. Stay in column one, go down rows one, two, three, and four. Shift to column two, go down rows one, two, three, and four. Column three, rows one, two, three, and four. Column four, one, two, three, and four, right? That's the notion of a nested loop. And that's how you can get to every item in an array. You also, if you use linear indexing, you can also do a for loop, right? 
you take the number of rows, you take the size of it, multiply rows by columns, and then do a do a linear indexing from one to whatever that value is, right? And that would take you down. That would that would weave you through it like that, right? So sort of three ways to get through an array, or you can mask the hell out of it, and then there you go. You don't have to go through all that. Yes. So for on line sixty one and sixty three. Oh, you're looking at the code. I didn't get in there. Okay, go ahead. No, oh, no. I was going to explain the code next. You want to wait or you want to ask your question? I'll wait. Okay. You can ask your question if you want to. Okay. So, we're going to go through, I don't even know what this does. What does this do? We're counting vowels. We're counting vowels and replacing them with dollar signs. What the hell? Why did I do that this way? Okay, whatever. Okay, let's let's just count vowels first. What about replacing dollar signs? With? Okay. Let's, let's work through this. Well, let's talk about it, then I'll, I'll go through it. Okay, remember, our loops get us to the data, and our conditionals help us to make some decision once we get there. Okay. So, first thing I'm going to do, take the size of A. Size is your friend because it gives you your bearings here, right? That you know how many rows, how many columns. And that enables you to use this for loop. I usually... When I'm traversing an array, I usually use a for loop. Very self memory is a while loop because I already know how many rows, how many columns, right? So, for, so I'm counting vowels. So, once again, I'm, I'm accumulating the sum here. So, I'm going to set my vowel count equal to zero. And then uh, for R, equal one to the number of rows. So, in this case, it's going to be one to, what does A look like? I can get the A looks like. I can do this. One to four. So, rows is four, calls is four. So, this is going to be for R is going to be the value one, then it's going to be the value two, then three, then four. Remember, this is a vector. One colon four, in this case, it's four, is the vector one, two, three, four. Okay. And here, you don't need this. I'm just showing you what the value of rows is here. This is an educational thing. And here's my inner loop. So, this is my outer loop. I'm going to hold the row steady. So, row is going to equal one the first time. Then I'm going to loop through my columns for C equals one to the number of columns. This is still one, two, three, four, just in this case, because we have the same number of rows as columns. I'm going to show you what C is. I should have showed you what R is there. I'll change that. Show you what C is. Then I'm going to show you the value A indexed at that row, which is the first time through will be one, and at that column, the second, the first time through that will be one. So it's going to show you A at one comma one, which in this case would be the letter A, for choice of names. If it is a vowel, assuming that these are all capital letters, right, then increment my vowel count. In, in, and in, go back up. This inner loop will then execute again, and columns will now be two. Row will still be one, right, because I haven't finished my inner loop here. Row will still be one. I mean, row will still be one. So now columns will be two. So now I'm going to access A, the first row, second column, which will be the letter B. Check to see if it's a vowel. If it is, increment. Come back up to my inner loop. Now C will be three. So now I check first row, third column. I get a C here. That fails. And I come back through. Then I get to my fourth one. C now equals four. So first row, fourth column. That's D. So I check and come back up. Now I've run out here. So I come back. It comes down to the next end and comes back up here to my outer loop, right? Now rows gets incremented by one. So that becomes two. And now I enter this whole thing over again. Now C now starts at one again and loops through all the way to four. Right? And then when I finish that, I come back up. That's how the nested loop works. The outer loop moves slower than the inner loop. 
Okay, so let's look at this. Let me efficient be R. And I'm just showing you these values so that it helps you. All right, so let's uh let's run it. Bad. Let me get rid of B here. So we can put A up on the screen at the same time. Good enough. So there's A. How about we remove the semicolon so people can see what's going on? Uh, yeah. All right, so there's A. There's my size, four rows, four columns. I start off and I initialize my vowel count to be zero. Now I start off for R equals one to rows. So R is equal to one, and for C equals one to columns, so C is equal to one at this point in time. I access A at one comma one, which is the value A. Check to see if that's a vowel. It is, so line 61 does execute, and vowel count gets incremented to one. Now I go back up to line 57. C now takes on the next value in that vector, which is two, so C is now two. Now I access A, at one comma two. It is not a vowel, so I go back up. Now C is three. So I access A at one comma three. And so on and so forth. So now C is four. One comma four is D. Now, and I failed that test. Now I'm finished with that loop because now I've hit the end of this vector. So now I'll come back up to my outer loop. So now, R equals two. Right, and then now I loop through C once again. C is now one, and then it's two, and then it's three. Uh, come on. Yeah, vowel count increments. So now, how come I'm not seeing this? Come on. So C increments one, two, three, four. Y'all get this? And so on and so forth. It's repetitive because it's supposed to be. Right. Now, did I answer your question? Um, no, but okay. I just had a question on like for 56 and 58. I was just confused why you're able to just have um, that memory location there without like setting it equal to something. Because what, what's the default? If you just have something, what does it get set equal to? A and S, right. And so what you're seeing is A and S. That's just my, I could have put DISP that, but I just wanted to show you the value. And so that's my lazy way of showing you what the value is. Right. It is unnecessary for this algorithm to work. That's instruction. Lines 56 and 58 are purely instruction. Right. And actually, so is line 59. You don't have to see that to make this work. Right. Because I'm checking. Well, no, it isn't. I'm sorry. You do have to assign X. Right. Now, here I could have just said, a at R, I mean, A indexed at R comma C equal equal that. I could have done that. I didn't need to sign it to X here. I could have just done it directly here. Either way works. Right. Y'all getting this? Taking it slowly because, you know. All right. We're going to take a five minute break. I'm going to finish my coffee while it's halfway warm. Right. And then we'll come back and do some examples. But I think that was good warm up. All right, so we'll do something breaky. There are snack machines across the hallway, bathrooms around the corner. Feeling cold, go outside for about five seconds and you'll warm up enough to last the rest of the lecture. All right. <laughs>
Do you ever have a TV that has no audio out? I do. Have a TV at home. Yeah, they are slow. Which I don't mean. Well, they make good. They they make good work monitors. Like, oh, yeah. 
for my uh, yeah. do make good, you know, large spreadsheets and stuff. I'm doing a vertical monitor right now. Like, just vertical. They do a vertical, yeah. The verticals are nice. So, I'll try some older American jazz. The chess? Older, older American jazz. Oh, older American jazz, okay. I just, I just pulled the jazz box, that's all. I put in, type in older American jazz. Yeah. It's great stuff. Our access to music nowadays. I look back on when I was in records. So, so yeah, records are cool when you have streaming music like we have now, because you can always get to whatever you want to listen to or about 0.05% of the music that's out there. You can just buy anything you want to listen to, anytime you want to listen to, in any order you want to listen to. It's just, it's just there. I came from a day, so records are a thing. I came from a day where the record was it. That was it. That was that was all you had, right? So, and you couldn't listen to it unless you were home. No portable, none of it, right? No, they didn't. When I was a kid, Walkman didn't exist. I came through the evolution of 45, 33 records. That's what we, that's where I started. That we had eight tracks, and I had a cousin who had a reel-to-reel -reel player. He was really cool, which is two reels. It's like a big cassette, but it was on two big reels. That's where music started for me. I saw the evolution from eight tracks to cassettes, and then the, that beat is tall in the car. And you have to be able to walk the Walkman ones. So that took us to the next level. I mean, both of us still had their issues. Yeah, what? We didn't, but we didn't care about issues. It was think about it. We had no alternative, and we had never seen anything like this. You could actually walk around with your music. And you could put it in your ears, and not nobody else could hear it. that. You don't understand? That was freaking amazing. That was like, hold up, I mean, I can listen to my music anytime I want to, and not disturb people. People who lived in metropolitan areas now, I can be on the train, I can be on mass transit, and listen to my music, or listen to whatever I wanted to. The evolution, the fact that I can walk in my mouth, in my house, and say, "Hey, who play whatever," and my house fills up with whatever I want to play, whenever I want to play it, is freaking insane. It is just amazing. I, to, my, to my daughter, it's like, understand what's the, what's the big deal? She comes back from Peru this weekend. I'm so excited. She's been gone for two weeks, and it's going to be interesting to watch her enjoy the luxuries. She has not had in the last two weeks, especially the last week, because the first week they were touring cities. The last week they've been out in a village making bricks in, in a river, pulling mud off the riverbank, making bricks and making baskets. That's what they've been doing for the last four days. They are ready to come home. It's very eye opening. I told her it's a cultural, historical, and technical experience she will pull from. Being able to make housing drives economy. So. All right. So I'm very excited about her return. Apparently, whatever time I went to sleep, man, I just thought I'd go sleep. All righty. I woke up a little bit earlier to get you play. All right, so let's get to some example problems here. Some of these are well stated. Some of these are half problems that we'll just get some examples through. But let's start with this one. This is in no particular order because they all have their same level of difficulty, or they all have various levels of difficulty. All right. Function name is candy count. You're given a string listing the different types of different kinds of candy separated by spaces. And then you're given a string listing all of the candy in the store separated by spaces. In other words, you work you work in a store, right? You're going down the counters, you're counting candy. Right? And then there's an overall list of the, all the different types of candy that you have, right? And so you've got to use that. You got to use the first list is what you're counting. And the second list is the inventory 
of all the different types of candy. And you've got to determine how many different types of candies you have. So, uh, so here's the example. So here's your input. You're counting, you see your Snickers, you see your Hershey's, M&M's, Mike and I, Kit Kats. Okay. Other way around. This is the list of stuff that, these are the candies that you can have. This is your manifest. And then these are the inventory. So you have Snickers. You count a Snickers, you count an M&M, &M, an M&M, &M, a Mike and Ike, a Snickers, a Hershey's, a Hershey's, and then a Mike and Ike, M&M's, and, and Kit Kats, right? And what you have to generate is this list, which says I have two Snicker bars, two Hershey's, three M&M's, one Mike and Ike, and one Kit Kat. Does that make sense? Or did I confuse you? These are all the different types of candy you have, and this is your inventory list. You've got to go down here and count how many of each and then generate this list. Think about that for a while. Back to jazz. Old American. Give you a few minutes to think about that. You don't have to code it, but think about how you would do that. How you doing? Uh, description of the The point of this drill is for you to be a rather long and confused for when you exactly what you're doing. Give this a mental try and then we compare what you did to what I did and then we discuss the middle of it. Okay. So here's what I did. When I addressed this, I said, okay, do this one of two ways. And what I decided to do, uh, Like I thought with string token, you have to have like whatever you're looking at, and then don't you have to have like a common token? Here? Yeah. You mean common? If it's not there, what's the default? Oh, it's a it's space. Okay. So here was my strategy, was to go down the list of candies. All right. So the first candy in the list, I don't know, M&M's. And then look at my inventory, find all the M&M's in the inventory. Right, count all the M&M's in the inventory. So I did it the other way, right? I went down, I said, okay, well, let me go down the list of candies that I have, and then look in my inventory to see how many I have of each. Right? 
That was my strategy. So I started off with my output string, which is my, my table, if you will. Uh, keep in mind my output. That was a good idea. Let's see if I can do this again. Uh, it would be helpful if all of this were on the screen at the same time. So let's do this. Let's put that over there. All right. All right. That looks helpful. So let's do that. Okay. So what I did was I said, okay, let's start with Snickers. And then let's see how many Snickers are here. And then let's make a, a line of output that says that. Right. And then let's loop and then let's go to Hershey's and then let's see how many Hershey's are here. And then let's make a line of output that says that. Right. This was my strategy. Now, what am I invoking? Well, I, I'm doing a, a number of steps, at least three steps, right? I've got to pull the name of the candy from my first list. Well, we just got finished doing a whole bunch of that, right? That's that's the whole that's the whole string token thing, right? I'm going to take my list, right? and get the first thing off of it. Right? And then we're going to use that. Well, how am I going to use that? I'm going to find how many times that shows up in here. Now, I got to get clever about that, right? You got, to, you got to do something. This is when my cleverness. How do I find how many times it's in there? Well, I did a string find, right? I took the entire inventory, which is the second one here, right? And I did a string find. So I get the token here. And then I string find to find out the indices of where that is here. I don't care where it is. What do I care about? How many times it shows up, right? So this string find is going to give me back the indices of the leading character wherever Snickers shows up. <clears throat> I don't care what that number is. I just want to know how many of them there are. So I'm just going to take the length of this. Does that make sense? You see my technique there? String find is going to give me the indices of wherever that string is. Right? But I don't care where it is. I just want to know how many times it is. So I take the length of that vector and that will give me how many of that, how many Snickers are in there. Cool. So now I have the name Snickers and I know how many times it shows up too. So I make an output line displaying that. Right. And so Let's print F. This holds the space for Snickers. Go over two tabs. Could have been one. And yeah, it didn't matter, right? Two tabs, then put the number, and then do a new line. Right? And so what fills this is this candy, which is my which came off my inventory list. Right? And then the count that I just calculated goes there. Boom. New line. We start over. Right, and I concatenate that string onto my output string. There you go. You see the different parts and how they all work together. Right, this is what you got to get to. It's this notion of I'm doing this in stages. Yes. For um, Alistair, can you output empty brackets? Can I output empty brackets? No, like for Alistair, can you? Oh, right here? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I put so the null string and empty brackets in this case are the same. I just created something empty to hold the string. Please. Do you need the out string? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I need to do this. You mean up here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I don't put this here, what happens when I get here? Remember, you evaluate the right hand side and assign it to the left hand side. The first time through, when I go to evaluate this, if I didn't do this up here, what's going to happen when it looks for out string? I'm not going to find it. There's no. If if I don't put this line here, if line five goes away, then the first time I encounter out string is on the right hand side here. The computer is going to look for it. It's going to add. I don't know what. See what I'm saying? It's not defined. It has to be predefined before I assign it anything. Before I assign it to anything. Does that make sense? You said you, you have an outstring, you have this string. With no outstring. Like, if I just did this string? Yes. Okay. Then, well, keep in mind, what I'm doing here is outstring is this whole thing. Right? So I'm building this up. 
as I go. You see, it starts here at that and ends at this. So I'm building this as I go, right? Yeah, if I was just kicking out one line at a time, then I wouldn't need to accumulate this, right? But I'm building out string as I go, so I'm adding to it. Right? So I'm using the output of this S print F and I'm concatenating it out into the out of string every time, right? Does that make sense? There's a lot of subtle stuff going on there. So I use something from one string to search another string, figure out how many there are, and then I make me a nice little output. And this output could be anything. It could be a chart. We could write it to an Excel file once we get a little further along. We do a lot of things. Right? But right now, we just make an out string. Okay. Could have changed this problem. Could have asked you. I could have asked you. Uh, what do we have the most of? What do we have the most of? So how do you do that? Right. Well, you do it a couple of ways. If these keep the same index, right, then I can put these in a vector, find the maximum, and find the index of that maximum. Right. And then use that index to find out which one of these I have. You could do it that way. What makes this difficult is it's hard to store these any place because they are different lengths. So we have, to, we, have to, we have to wiggle around. That's why we don't give you that kind of problem right now. When we get to heterogeneous data, then this is easy. Let's see. We could ask you the total how many how much candy we have. And check it out. If I gave you, here's another thing we could do. If I if input, if I gave you a third input that was the price of each thing, right? Then I could ask you to total out my inventory. Fair question, right? If you have a third input that in order gives you the price of each item. Then when you go through and do this, you can just keep a running total. You multiply the number of Snicker bars you have by the price because the price will be in the same index. So I can find the price of Snicker bars, multiply that, and keep a running total. And then I can total out my, my index. Does that make sense? Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. You see how this problem can expand. That's what I'm going to show you. OK. Move on to another problem. Okay, I don't like this problem, but we're going to do it anyhow. I don't like the problem because the description is a little wonky. Um, all right. Maybe it would help if I did this. What is your name? Clara. Clara? Okay, we're gonna do a Clara here. You are now, you are now a thing, right? We're gonna do a Clara, which means I'm gonna split this problem into two views because you suggested me doing this. Why are you being scared, Clara? I, I don't know. I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> you, did you not ask me to do the problem on one with the example? Oh on yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So that's what I'm gonna do oh, for this okay. problem. I was. So that's a thing okay. now. Okay. Clara okay. was confused. I, I She's back you. with us now. Okay. Here we go. All right. Here we go. Uh, let's do a clear here. Okay. Make sure All right. So you got some kind of encrypted message. Uh, you're given a message to encrypt, and you're given a vector of number letter pairs. That's your key that you're going to use to encrypt with. All right. And you got to output the encrypted message. All right, so you're given a message that needs to be encrypted and the encryption code as a string containing pairs of numbers and letters. Encrypt the message by replacing each character in the message with the number that precedes it in the code string. That's the second thing there. If the character is not in the code string, then copy it into the encoded message. Unchanged. Return the encrypted message. Okay, so here's what this looks like. 
So, here's my message. Here's the encryption code here, right? So, number letter pairs, right? So, once again, you have to understand how your data is formatted, right? You have the letter, excuse me, you have the number, then you have the letter, the, the digit, then the letter, then the digit, then the letter, then the digit, then the letter, right? So, lowercase s will get converted to the number four. Lowercase e gets converted to the number eight. Lowercase t to seven, lowercase o to three, capital T to two, right? So when this thing gets encrypted, the T becomes two, the lowercase o becomes three, spaces stay spaces. If it's not in the code, it doesn't get changed, right? So this lowercase b is not in here, so it remains unchanged. Your punctuations remain unchanged, your spaces remain unchanged. Does this make sense? Right. So what you're doing. Okay. So think about that and how you go about making it happen while we pay a few minutes of old American jazz. That's 1920s throwback is a little more. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of 
Showing you is to show there's, you know, some people would say, well, why don't I just go to each letter of the message and then go back to the code to see if it's encoded, right? That is one way to do it. Go down each letter of the message, go look at the code to see what the encode, encryption code would be. I went the other way and I said, okay, for I equal one colon two colon length of code. Right. So, that's going to be the vector one colon two colon the length of anything is all odd indices, right? I realized that, uh, yeah, so I did here. So each time I do a loop, I'm accessing here, 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 and here. Does that make sense? Because I realized they're pairs. And so I'm jumping through each pair. Okay, so this was my way of getting to each pair in the code. The character is whatever this index is plus one because the characters sit on the even indexes, right? The code is the index, right? Because I'm going one colon two colon n, right? So this loop will go one, three, one, three, five, seven, nine, right? Which when I is one, then I'm getting um, the letter, what is it? S. So this becomes lowercase s and this becomes four. Do you see that? All right. All right. And so now I'm just going to do a string replacement, I'm take the message, find out where that character is, and replace it with that number. And keep in mind the numbers, these are digits, so they're all characters. I just call them. They're all characters. Yes. Okay. What is I? It's all odd indices, right? So I plus one is, if I is all odd indices, then one I plus one is what? All even indices, right? And I did that because I recognized that this is odd indice and it's matching even indice. Right? right? And that's the pattern that look, I look for patterns. Computer scientists always look for patterns. Right, because computers repeat very well. So if I can find patterns, I can take advantage of the repetition. Right? And so, so I sort of flipped. Another way to do it would 
be, uh, you could go down the message, take the character, and then do a string find in the code to find out if it's in the code or not, right? And if it is, once you found it, back up one, and then that will give you the number. Does that make sense? You can do it that way as well. So there's two ways, there's probably many ways to do this. Yes. Wait, I don't have a question. Yes, the man with fractals on his shirt. No, I don't have a question. You have a question? No. Did you go to the University of Chicago? Huh? Have I been there? You have a shirt on that says University of Chicago. Did you oh. go there? Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Oh, you didn't go to school there? I go, you... I go to school here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Is this helping? Is this helping? Okay. All right. So let's continue on. Uh, let's do the next problem. Okay. This next one's not a problem. It's some cool stuff that I did one time. I just want to show you. You have the file. You can look at it. Uh, so. Basically, if you run this code, if you run this code, you wind up with this. So basically, I was sitting around one day and figuring out, can I generate a deck of cards? And so the answer is yes, you can. If you're interested in how I did it, look at my code, figure it out. Right. The, next, the next thing was, could I do blackjack? Right. I was going to make it play poker and blackjack. Right. Oh, you can do it. It's just this is what nerds do in their time off. You do it too. It's just, you just do it with some biology or some aerospace shit. But you do nerdy stuff too, right? So, um, but yeah, you can. These characters here. So you wonder how I got the clubs, the spades, and the diamonds and the hearts. These are hexadecimal. So I, I told you at one point in time about this thing called Unicode. How it's not, it doesn't stop at ASCII. There's a whole world of codes. That's what, that's what these are. And I was able to make, make those. Uh, so this is what nerds do. All right. Uh, let's go to, let's go to this one for you math people. I want you to say a word that scares some people, Fibonacci. Everybody, everybody knows the Fibonacci sequence? First two numbers in Fibonacci are zero and one, then every other number is the sum of the two previous numbers. Y'all, y'all did do this some point in. Why y'all looking at me like that? Oh my god! And some of you are like, oh my god, he's going to kick me out of school if I say no. <laughs> the Fibonacci sequence of numbers. Oh goodness! Wow. Uh, okay, maybe we shouldn't do this problem. If, uh, I can't spell it. I can say it's not. sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is the series of numbers. The next number is found by adding up the two numbers before. So you start with zero and one. Those are the given. You got to start somewhere, right? So the third Fibonacci number is one. The next Fibonacci is 1 plus 1, which is 2. The next one is 1 plus 2, which is 3. And then 2 plus 3, which is 5. Add infinite. Okay. So the key is always how do you determine the next number in the Fibonacci sequence, right? So there's there's math in this. If there were math majors in the room, they would be like, boo, your explanation sucks. But that's what we got. Uh, there are actually a lot of phenomena that sort of occur naturally. The Fibonacci. Uh, in the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, so so our task here is you are given the index of the number in the Fibonacci sequence that you want misspelling to retrieve, and you output the Fibonacci number indicated by the input index. Okay. Uh, there are many more sophisticated ways to do this than I did, but uh, Fibonacci numbers are a sequence of integers starting with 0 and 1. And, uh, these new numbers. Okay, so how do you do this? Given that definition of the Fibonacci sequence, these are 
Let me put it over here. Hold up. These are the test cases. Ah. Go the other way this time. All right, give that a thought for a second. Maybe it is. Obviously, you loop, it means the problem is iterative by nature. Is it because I had the first two in your I started like the third. I was just going to show one in place. Mm -hmm. So what's sort of obvious, I don't know how obvious, but is that look, you're going to iterate, right? Um, and so you're going to get this number, and that should tell you just about how many times you got to do this, taking the previous two and adding. becomes what I have to do about one, what, what I do for the first two. The first two are different than every other one. So I got to account for the fact that if you ask me for the first Fibonacci number, I don't get that one by adding the previous two. That's just zero. And if you ask me for the second one, 
I got to deal with the fact that that one's just one. Everything after that, if you give me the third one, then I'm going to take the previous two, which is index one and index two, or index, if I'm at index three, which is index n, this is me sketching a solution. If I'm at index n, then I'm going to take n minus one plus index n minus two. Add those together, and then that's me. All right? Does that make sense? So I can build the Fibonacci sequence by doing that. So the notion is I build the Fibonacci sequence for whatever the index is, and then I read off the last value, and that's that's the number. That's my strategy, right? Minus doing zero and one, I mean one and two, because they're already built in. So I got to deal with one and two, and then everything after that, I can build the Fibonacci sequence in a vector, and then just read off the end of the vector, and that should do it, right? So. That's my general strategy. Now I got to clean it up a bit, make it work. And quite honestly, that's how I code. I'm not a professional coder. I'm not a software engineer. I'm a teacher. Right? Um, I would probably, it would probably take me about three months to get my skill set up to being an intro level software engineer because I don't code every day. But software engineers are awful teachers. So there we go. Uh, uh, not necessarily. Some of them are pretty good too. All right, so let's look at this. Let me put this up over here. Well, okay. So I get in an index. I'm going to return a number. My be my beginning sequence starts like this. That's given. That's once again when I talk about domain knowledge. When I talk about read the problem and understanding domain knowledge, you got to understand that you can't do this problem. Yeah, you got to know what a Fibonacci sequence is. All right. While the length of the sequence is less than the index, now what does that mean? That's how I'm dealing with the zero, one, the one, two thing, right? The length of this sequence is two, right? If they ask me for the first index, for the first number, then two is not less than one. So I don't do this. I just give them the first value because I already have the sequence. Does that make sense? All right, so here we go again. Remember, I have to deal with if they ask for the first or second Fibonacci number, right? That's a different calculation than them asking for the third and on. So this is how I deal with it. This sequence starts off as two. If you ask me for the first or second one, this is going to be false, right? And then I'm just going to give you the first or second one. Got it? If you ask me for the third one, then three is greater than two. So now I enter here, right? And what I'm going to do is use this loop to build the sequence. Right? I'm going to build the sequence here. So. While the length of the sequence is less than the index. So if you ask for the third one, my sequence doesn't have three values in it yet. So I've got to build it up to that. Right? So here's how I build the sequence. The next Fibonacci number is the sequence n minus one plus n. So I'm going to add these two, and then I'm going to concatenate that number onto the sequence. And then I'm going to go back up here again to see if I've made my sequence long enough because you asked for the third one. If you ask for the third one, then after I do this, now I have three things in my sequence. I drop down and give you the third value in my sequence. Right? If you ask for the fourth one, then I've got to keep doing this until the sequence has four things in it, and then I give you the fourth one. Does that make sense? There are other ways to do this, right? but this is just how I thought about the problem. Yes? Um. I'm a bit stuck because when I like tried to run my code, um, I ended up getting like I started off with the zero one vector, and then I just ended up making like an infinite loop of zero one 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 one. Right. What's your terminating condition? I'm sorry. You started whispering, man. Well, I did. I, 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 as you said. 
Well, the index is greater than the length of um, SIF, which is my sequence for you. Right, if index is, but how are you building your index? This is when I wish you could throw your code up and get all of our from. Um, how are you building your sequence? Is your sequence getting longer each time? I thought it was, but the way that I started mine out was after the function, I just had the sequence be an empty vector, and then I made um, the sequence like zero, 01 after I made the while statement. Well, what's your while, what's your condition in your while statement? The index is greater than the length of the sequence. And then you get your index bigger each time through by doing what? Concatenating the sequence with the index sequence. Okay, but if you don't fill your initial sequence until after your while loop, then how does it know how to start? You're not, you see I'm saying? You're probably not seeding it properly to begin with, right? This whole thing is predicated on you have to start with something. So it's one of those problems where you have to understand what we call edge cases, right? In general, the majority of Fibonacci numbers are calculated by you take the sum of the previous two. But at the beginning, you've got to get started, right? And that's what this is about. How do you get started? That's the difficulty of this problem, right? It's easy to figure out. If I just said generate a number, if I told you that index would never be less than three, this problem gets easier. Right, because you don't have to worry about the index being one or two. Right. Does that make sense? We can look at it afterwards, but does that general description make sense? All right. Let's do one more, then we'll take a break, then we'll do some more. Um, I like this problem. Yeah. Let's do the Migos problem. Okay. For those of you who don't follow the genre of music called trap music, it's a branch of hip hop or rap, if you will, uh, there's a group out of Atlanta called the Migos. I owe this all to my daughter because for a long time I despised trap music because I thought it wasn't true to the game of hip hop. But then she had me slow down and listen to it and I found some merit in it and I actually liked what the Migos were putting down and the fact that they're from Northeast Atlanta, uh, which, you know, Northeast Atlanta is like Dunwoody, y'all. It's like, this is not a hard place to live. It's not, it's the freaking suburb. It's the, it's the, it's the neighborhood surrounding Perimeter Mall, right? This is where these guys are from, right? They're from that part of town. It's not like they're from you know, Southwest Atlanta, where Outkast is from, and Goody Mob and all that. Anyhow, uh, I got into watching Migos. And then, so they do this thing when they, when one of the things they do is they have these, they're going along and they just make these comments in the middle of the song, which actually add to the song, which blows my mind. And I actually like that shit, right? I actually wait for the yep or something like that to come up in the song. So if those of you who've listened to Migos, you know this. Uh, anyhow. So I made this problem, right? Uh, you get in a string, you get back a string that's modified with a Migos call after every word ending in a vowel, right? It's a silly problem, but that's okay. So every word that ends in a vowel, now there's, there's, there's a hook here, right? No pun intended, but there's a hook here. So every word that ends in a vowel, you have to modify it so, that, let me let me do this this way, so you can see the output. Okay, so so score ends in a vowel. Four does not end in a vowel. Square ends in a vowel. So I add a y y. I don't know how you pronounce that, but you put it there. Right? Then uh, a go ends in a vowel, so you put a hey there, and then. Uh, I ends in a vowel, so you put a woo there, and then so on and so forth, right? Uh, that confuses me. Why is that not? Why is that not like it's supposed to? Let's run this again to see if I did something wrong. No, that's it. 
OK. So now, here's the, here's the killer here. If, oh, I'm, I'm showing you the code. I should not be. But let, let me just show you the code in this one. If I was only using one word, right? If everything was a hey, right? Then the problem's relatively straightforward, right? You go through, and if a word ends in a vowel, if you get each token, and if that token ends in a vowel, you now concatenate the word hey after that word, and you keep building, right? But what I did was I gave a string here, and basically you choose, is, did I do this randomly, or did I do it? Oh, hell, this was, this is. Uber confusing. Uh, basically, I use mod to do some semi random selection of which one of these you would choose, which is pretty much how the Migos is doing, right? Um, <laughs> I'm sure, I did, sure they didn't do this to, <laughs> to figure out. But so, what the hell did I do here? Uh, so I kept count of how many call outs were in that I encountered, which basically is how many words end in a vowel. Um, see, does this make sense? So here, the count would be one. Let me put this up on the other screen, just a second. This up. Uh, let's put the function up on the screen. And I did this problem just to show how wide an application you can, how widely you can apply something like this. Okay, so, uh, so here at this point, my call out count, when I encounter my first, so I pull the token off, and in case the token ends, Right, token index it is in. If it is in one of these, I said here, keep in mind, I'm using a switch statement here, right? So I couldn't do my usual vowel check thing, right? Because I don't have, I can't use compound or statements or anything here. So what I just did is I just articulated and I used Y here. So Migos recognize Y is about, okay? There we go. And notice I just, in a case statement, I could not do the relational operator, so I just articulate every vowel, lowercase and uppercase. Okay. So if the token ends in one of these, then ah, okay. So then I had to figure out which one of these words I was going to use. So what I did was I took the call out count, which by this point the call out count is zero. I mod that by three, which is zero. So this equals zero, right? Plus one. So I'm going to use the word blue here. Is that what happened or did I use a different word? I used a different word. How the hell did that happen? Uh, now I'm confused. How uh, about start? So I start zero. Call out count is zero, zero. Uh, three is zero, zero times four is zero, plus one, call out start is one. Call out equals call out start, which is one, plus two, which is three. So that should be call outs one to three. Why the hell is it not working? And call outs equals call out one. Hmm. I told you I didn't like this example. You see what my problem is here? This 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 should be giving me this should be giving me a woo, not a A. Why is it giving me the wrong one? That's why. When it came through here the first time, we got the first token. The first word in this is not 
The first word is four. It does not end in the vowel. At the end of this loop, call out count gets incremented by one each time. Right. So when I came back up, so I went through and got the word four, that's wrong. Excuse me, that doesn't make it through here, but the call out count gets incremented by one anyhow, right? So now when I come through here, call out count is now one. So one mod three is one times four is four plus one is five. So I'm starting here at the one, two, three, four, fifth index, right? And then I get the fifth index. Since each one of those is three letters long, I add two to it. So from the fifth index to the seventh index is what the word is, and that pulls off a y y, right? And then that concatenates that inside of parentheses into the string as I build it. Right? So I'm building my output string here on line 13, right? And if I don't, if it's not a vowel, then I just add the token to the output string. So either if it is a vowel, I'm going to add the token, but then I'm going to put whatever call out I select into parentheses, right? If it's not, if it does not end in the vowel, then I just put the token in there, right? And I build my output string that way, right? So this is how I generated this random thing is by using this, what I recognize is I had three words and so I had three words here. And so I choose which one of those three words by some random thing on the call out count here, right? I mod that, multiply it by four, which will either give me the one, the five, or the nine here, which is where they start. And then I index the call out string at that value. Right. That's complex. Like I said, that's overly complex. If I had given you the words to begin with, and once again, once we get into heterogeneous data, we don't have to worry about the size of data. I could have put that in an array and just done the first row, second row, and third row, and it would just worked out a lot better because those words are the same length. Now that seems overly complex, but understanding the subtleties of that is important. Is that this is how I figured out how to extract one of these from this string. That's what I did there. So understanding that is another level of understanding. But the general thing is look at each word, see if it ends in a vowel. Here I use the switch statement instead of an if statement. Could use an if here. I could have, I guess I could have used a for loop instead of a while loop, but when you're going down looking at tokens, a while loop is just so much easier. Yeah. All right. Let's take a break and come back and we'll do a couple more problems and then we'll be done. So five minutes and then we'll come back and we'll do some. We'll start at 11.25. There is no mindset, but
I don't know why yours is not showing that. There's two things going on here. Let's see. Older. Let me go ahead and run. Okay, refresh your screen and see if you have this bowl in your phone. These are all published, so you should be able to see all of this. I have the folder, but it's still there. Can anybody else, so everybody else can see the files that I'm showing? I mean, something's wrong with your account. Some, your account's not. I don't know why. You couldn't see the what? What? Well, because the files didn't exist. Now they did. I just put them into. I put them in. There's a folder called Example Problems inside of the. Uh, I just add, I just added that one. So those files, it's not that you couldn't see them, they just didn't exist. She's clicking on the button and she, it's, she says she doesn't have access. I don't understand why you don't have access. You can see them? Yeah. But I, I don't understand why you don't have access. Those permissions are set. Let me see your, let me see your, uh, your ID for a second. I can figure out. Are you on a VPN or how are you log in? Your edge of Rome or what? Your edge of Rome? Okay, you should be okay security wise. So that I should transfer. It's not the sending me. It seems like it's a white so this one is having to have your email out. Well, the only thing I can say is you walk out the long back end. Somehow, because everything I see, you're 
your permission is what is supposed to be. Uh, I downloaded the folder of snap going in, and it went like this, and I'm able to pull it up. It let you download it, but it didn't let you access it. Okay. Well, that's why I provide the zip files too. So that was the download one. Yeah. You just understand as a child, you understand it's jacked up. Yes. And then they try to give you all these little rules, and for every rule, there's an exception. So after a while, you're like, screw this shit. I mean, you literally, as a fourth grader, you're like, okay, I tried to play by y'all's rules. I realize half of this is just memory, right? It's, it, it, there it is. It just, but then you realize the why of it is, like I said, you throw a whole bunch of cultures into a capitalistic society, and it just all bubbles up into an amalgamation. It's a language that's just a whole bunch of stuff put together. There are no rules. Like I took Latin in high school. There were rules in Latin. It made freaking sense. You conjugated something, and it made sense, right? There was masculine. There was feminine. It all made sense. Likewise, most inflected languages make sense. French, Spanish, whatever, right? There's cultural influence. Weeds, but it all basically comes back to some core. English is just what it is because that's what it became. It's what got popular. That's how we do it. You're not going to make up your mind on these rules. Can we make up our? Have you seen this country? Have can we make up our mind on anything? No. That's that's what happens when you promote democracy. Is that everybody has an opinion, which means there's no right or wrong. It's just people talking. Richest person wins. Best country in the world. <laughs> I, that, okay, so don't go out on Reddit and call me some kind of political whatever. Okay, let's just put it. Yes. Um, I googled it, and it said that a vowel is really just a type of sound. So like, yeah, it's a e i o u, and sometimes y also makes those sounds. So that, that's why. Yeah. So like, y in the word y makes the i sound, right? But in the word yes, it makes the y sound. So therefore, it's a consonant when it goes y, and it's a vowel when it goes i. <laughs> you do it, you take the damn English test, you get an A, and you keep moving. I mean, <laughs> that's how we cope. <laughs> that's what you did, man. You memorized what you had to memorize. Just like, okay, you have the word S H O U L D, should, right? Yes. Then you have the word W O O D, would. Sounds exactly the same, spelled completely different. Right? Then you have the word W O U L D, which is also wood, but a completely different wood than W O O D, right? But then you have the word, I don't know, S O O T, which is, or uh, let's say, no, let's go F O O D, which is food. The same double O that said W O O D, but it sounds like ooh instead of ud. <laughs> it's because I lived it. I'm not saying it's just, but it's just like, I mean, I know, I really think. Okay, asking America to apologize for something is politically turbulent. I get it. We should apologize to people who have to learn our language as a second language because we just need to put a big label on it. This shit is fucked up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and if, you, if, you under, if you come from a language that makes some sense, your teacher should tell you from the beginning, this is messed up, right? And to start from there, right? Because my mother was a teacher for 40 years. Right? And I would ask her these types of questions. And after a while, she just says, it's because it is. Move on. Right? And there you go. It's like uh, my daughter takes Spanish. And her teacher told her, 
I guess in the third or fourth year of Spanish, her teacher said, if you ever think you're going to speak this without an accent, forget it. You will never sound like a native speaker. And that removes all kinds of pressure, right? It's like you're just always going to have, it's okay. It's not like people who speak Spanish are, are offended by it. I mean, I'm not offended by when people who have, who have native other languages speak English with an accent. It's just it's how you speak it, right? He speaks with a Finnish accent. Right, which I must admit is cool. It's like as a teacher, I collect accents because I see I meet students from all over the planet, right? And so you have people who have different and some accents I can pick up on, and others I have no idea, right, uh, what they are. Right? What really gets me is when they ask me to pronounce names at our student award ceremony every year. It's just not good. I was like, why do you all have me up here at the mic doing this? I don't do this. I, I butcher names, right? And so it's really bad. I actually, I wonder if I can take a class to learn how to pronounce names. Have y'all been to graduation yet? So they have people who train all year on how to pronounce names, and they do a, well, I, don't, I guess they do a fabulous job, right? The names sound right. I don't know. To the person whose name they're pronouncing, it might sound like crap. I don't know. The best one I've seen was at my nephew's graduation. This girl's name, they had in the program, her name had to be 40 characters long, right? And everybody saw it coming, because you know how they put your name in the program, and there's everybody's names like this, and then her name is like, like this. It's making the column five times wider than everybody else's, right? And when everybody was waiting for it, we're sitting there like, okay, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. He rolled this name off flawlessly, right? Her family stood up and actually applauded him for doing it properly. That's how good it was. Right? It, it was one of these graduations. There were 750 kids, and everybody got their name called. Right? And it took less than 80 minutes because, you know, you're a nerd. You're timing this shit because you're like, okay, how long is this going to take? All right, let's do one more problem before we leave. Uh, today, I hope this is this should help you with your homework because I think a lot of this is either a predecessor to your homework or is actually your homework problem. Let's do this one. I like this problem because it's about moaning. All right. So you're given four arrays. Right, with corresponding data. So the first indices refers to one investment, the second indices in each one refers to the second, and so forth. This is the present value, this is the money that you're putting in today. This is the interest rate, this is the number of times it gets compounded annually, and this is the time of your investment. Okay? Y'all have seen these formulas before? Time value of money. If you want to study one thing, study time value of money, right? You have, I told you this before. You get much more time. You're like, I don't have any money, but you get a shit ton of time. Right? And your earning potential is incredible. Right? Your money will go from this in the next few years to this. Right? If you learn how to save and invest now, you will retire by your mid-30s. Right? And you might not want to retire, but you might want to look at your boss and say, no, and just keep on moving. Right? That is freedom. That is freedom, young people. That's why you come here and endure this shit. Okay? Plus, it's just academic and money. It's not all for the money, but it's nice. Okay. So anyhow, so we're going to calculate uh, and do a report on these investments, right? And then we're going to determine what's the best investment and what's the worst investment based on how much they earn. Okay, so let me, let's just do this together. Okay, so now, this could have all been put in an array, so this problem could have been done in an array. I just did it in five different vectors, okay? But it could have been done in an array. And so you take in these four different vectors. I'm sorry, four different vectors. Uh, all right, so now, what's the index of the best investment? Well, let's start with zero because we don't know what it is. It's an unknown, right? There is nothing with an index zero, so let's start with the best investment right now has value zero because it's the lowest, right? right? My worst index of the worst investment is zero because I don't know what it is right now. And then the worst investment, right? I start off as high as it can possibly be, which is infinity. 
And when I find an investment less than infinity, that becomes my new worst investment. And then when I find one less than that, that becomes my new worst investment, right? So I had to start as high as possible to be able to, the first comparison is going to set the first one to the worst investment. Does that make sense? Just like I started the best one at zero. So the first investment that I come up with is going to become my new best investment. And then it will compare after that. Do you understand that strategy? Right. And INF is what MATLAB considers to be infinity. Right. It's a concept. Just it's not a real number. Don't go in there and try to find out what the number is. Right. It's a concept. It is helpful. All right. So for the length of, I could have chosen any vector because they're all the same length. They have to be because they have corresponding data. It's one of those problems where you're given multiple vectors that have corresponding data, right? Now that you know how to use arrays, we usually just stick it all into an array because that way it's just rows. I could have concatenated this all together into an array, but I didn't. All right, future value of money equals, and this is the formula to calculate the future value of money based on the present value of money, interest rate, um, number of times um, compounded annually, and how many years the investment runs. Okay. All right. Then once I calculate the future value, then so the output looks like whoa, 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 whoa. The output looks like this here. This. So my initial investment is here. This money invested at 5% interest compounded at one time a year for one year is. $105, right? If I compounded it twice a year for a year, it's $105.06, right? Four times a year for a year is $105.09. Uh, compounded 12 times a year is $105.12. You're like, well, what the hell am I investing for? Well, $105 is more than $100, right? And if you begin to take $100,000, which you will have to invest at some point in time, grasp that concept in your head. Right uh, at 12 percent interest, which the stock market does about 12 percent interest annually on average, uh, compounded four times, which you're not going to get it compounded four times a year for two years. You actually get one hundred and twenty six thousand dollars, six hundred and sixty seven dollars. This is why people who play the stock market are always worried about what the hell the interest rate is. Okay. All right. So uh, and obviously my best investment is the hundred thousand dollars. Here and my worst investment, which only yielded me five dollars, is the first one. Okay, good. All right. Uh, what I hope, if you don't get anything out of this, is the fact that I turned those numbers into a report that looks like this. Right. That's what financial. That's that's what all people do, right? You crunch numbers. You create a program that crunches numbers, and you turn around to your boss and give them a report. And from that report, their business gets better. That's the whole idea, right? Or the plane flies, or the vaccine works, or whatever, right? Whatever you whatever you do, right? Uh, that's the point. So, how did I do this? The calculation is here. This prints out. All I'm doing is using my f print. Oh, okay. Hold up. Ignore that. Act like that says s print f. You don't know this yet. Don't look at this. Act like that says S print F, and the whole thing does the same thing. Um, we'll get to F print F in about two weeks. Uh, but anyhow, this creates my output string, which looks like that, right? And I'm just doing the same thing I did with S print F, right? Uh, feeding in my values here. If my future value is better than my best value, keep in mind I set my best value initially to zero. So the first time through this loop, of course, my future value is going to be better than my best value. So that makes that the next best value. Does that make sense? And I keep track of the index of the best value. So every time through, I take my value and I say, is this my best value? Well, let me compare it to my last best value. If it's better than my, if it's greater than my last best value, that was my new best value, right? Keep track of that value and its index. If my value is not greater than my best value, then it can't be my new best value. So ignore it, right? Do the same thing with the worst value. Is this value less than my last worst value? If it is, set it equal to my new worst value. Keep track of the value and 
It's indices, it's index, right? And that's how I'm able, by keeping track of the value in the index, that's how I'm able to generate these two statements at the end. Yes? Um, could you have used an else if instead of creating another? Now, great question. Could I have used an else if instead of doing this? No, because I'm doing two. These are two separate. I, these are two separate things here. They're not related. My best and my worst have nothing to do with each other, right? If I put an else here, then if I figure out my best, could I have done that? Well, that assumes that I can't have an investment that's my, that's my best and my worst. I guess if I had one investment, it would be my best and my worst. Right? So, no, I separate them because the concepts are totally different. The concept of my best value has nothing to do with the concept of my worst value. Right? So I split. I only use the else as if they were making one choice between one or the other. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, classes over. I hope going through these examples will help you conceptualize your homework a little bit better. Notice I went through them slowly. There's no need to rush. There's a whole lot of nooks and crannies. So now y'all got to work on the nooks and crannies. This is how you get better. This is going to take work. Right, it just is. Now that you've got it, I've taught you how to bench press. Now we put weight on the bar. So we run one or two laps. Now we hit the marathon. Right. This is what we ran. A marathon a day for a hundred days. She's an amputee. She ran a marathon a day. I have that shirt. Did you? I have that shirt. I'm I mean, sure there these ultra marathoners out there. I'm just like, okay. Oh, yeah. That's taking the human body way beyond the We're the same thing. Ah, every day you have a problem. Okay, let's see. It's my TA. It's not you. All right. I really got to get on my TA. Uh, all right, which problem is it? I Oh, see. Do you ever eat cheese? Do you ever eat cheese? Do you ever eat cheese? Do you ever eat what you're saying is Twice and get points. There you go. Okay, that you. worked you well. up. I was really doing problems. What's the only way? It's the shift problem where given a vector and given a shift value, you have to shift into the vector to rotate over. That's where Molly comes in. Yeah, I have to. So I found, I started looking at certain patterns, but given the shift value, Okay, so it's a vector or an array? So is it a vector or an array? A vector. A vector. All right, so you can go right or left? Yeah. Okay. So what you want to do is, besides the things that roll over, it's easy, right? If you're going right, you just add one to each index. Yeah. Right? But if that index goes past the end, mm -hmm. then you mod it, right? Okay. You mod it by the length of the vector, Okay. right? So I need a marker here. Do I have a marker? Oh, man. 
Atom. No, no marker. That sucks. All right. Can I have some examples here? Yeah, I, I, I come out better when I write. That's okay. why I write. No marker. Uh, shoot, no marker. Uh, okay. How do I do this? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe this one. Let's try this. Uh, let's see if I can. This works out with the yeast. Hot damn. Okay. All right. Uh, erase that. Okay, that sucks. Okay, let's not do that. Um, uh, um, so, if I have spaces, let's say if I have, I don't know, let's, why am I way over there? Okay, here, I'll shift over. It's not recent. Ah, goodness. Well, I guess it, I was so happy. <laughs> Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech. There. There's probably a place to send it. Do y'all have quick questions? I have a question, like, from my own life. It's not quick. Oh, okay. Uh, gosh, I really need markers. So let's do, uh, let's do you know, pencil, pen, paper. Give me some paper. I knew it on paper. Because uh, that's how I think about this rotation thing, right? You know, in fact, I was doing a rotation thing last night when I was coding. Um, I have an iPad that work. Draw. Okay. Yeah. If you want me to draw on your iPad, that's great. Uh, I don't usually use iPads. But... Wow. We don't have pen and paper. We have iPads. <laughs> this is where we are in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I don't know what I'm doing with this working. All right, so if we have, let's say if we have, I don't know, R, S, T, U, V, right? And we're doing this, and that's in a vector. So this is one, two, three, four, five. And length of the vector is five, correct? Yeah. All right. So, and I always get the, let's not use U, V, let's use a Z here because that's confusing. All right, so. If we want to shift it two places to the right, this is what you call sketching the solution. All right, so if we want to do that. Everything shifts. Well, let's just do one place, make it easier. Everything shifts over one. And then this one wraps back around and becomes that one. So um, if we're doing that, In my new vector, everything that, 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 five plus one, the zero is always the problem. So if I take the index, I 
It's a freezing, <clears throat> freezing mod. In the program, right? You may not have to use mod. You may be able to use else but if state. Oh, okay. Right. Right. That's what. That's what I'm sitting here. And like, the more I look at it, the more I'm thinking. Do I need a mod? I don't know. Let's see, don't say. We gotta get out of this room sometime soon. Here. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Oh. How we can only use conditionals? Yeah, I know. You can't use each. I don't know. I was under the impression that it's only if and. Oh, it's only conditionals? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it is. Oh, okay. In that about. case. Okay, in that case, well, let's, let's not use this. So if I do this, I'm going to get an error. Oh, there's no I. Yes, but it went backwards. It went yeah, I'm just trying to get in some location, okay. in some direction. Uh, the pro see the problem with all this is this is where people this is where MATLAB indexing at one becomes a pain in the ass because mod doesn't. You always have to adjust because because of that. Uh, oh gosh. 
I'm really a blanket here. Uh, get to the right. The, the new one equals. So my strategy really would be to do this enough time so I see the pattern. So have you seen the pattern? Yeah, I've we'll find a bit of a pattern here. So it's like I have this vector, and I'm shifting it by minus four. So I move all by back by four. So that'll give me my index vector that looks like this. And then what it's supposed to be is actually this. So I have what's, what it looks like to be the pattern that I found is if you take the shift vector, take its modulus value, so that's four, and add twice that value to the first first three values, you get the new number. So this plus two times that gives you eight, plus eight here, plus eight here. So it's only doing it for the length of the vector plus this value, so the first three values. If, if you're shifting by four, you only do that for the first three values. So like here, I'm doing it by three, I'm only going to do it for the first value. But I don't know if that's something Can that's you control six. that? Yeah. That the problem is what it does with the other values. So, like, fine, it's fine for this one, but here it's adding by two for the rest of the values. Right. And here it's adding by one for the rest of the values. And right. Why it's doing that? I don't know. That's well, yeah. And that's 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 the problem I have with doing this. Like, it's like it's by one, by two. Right. So that's why I, I tend to use a small set like this mm -hmm. and uh, shift. What do we do? We shift to one, right? Yeah. One, one right. And then I solve it. I literally will sit hard, here hard -coded for a while. and do this and hard code it and find the pattern yeah. that way. That so sense. two right would be this would be old four, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And this would be old five. Six, and this seven. would be one, two, yeah. three. And that would be two to the right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. And then so three right. This would be over three, four, five, one, and two. All right, well, at least these are easier to write now. Let's see. Let's see. Four right would be two, three, four, five, one. Yeah. And then. I always choose some number that's small enough that I can do it by hand, but large enough that I'm, I'm pretty much guaranteed I'm getting a general case. If you should see my length of the vector, don't you just get the same vector? That's, yes, that's true, but I want this to show me that, and it did, okay? Yeah. So, and then if I did six right, so now this is the point, right? Yeah. Is now if I did six right, now am I back to where You're I started from the first before? right? Yeah. Right. So, I did six right, then this becomes five, then one, then two, then three, then four. Right. All right, so, okay, so I repeat every fifth one, no, every fourth one. Yeah, I repeat at mod, at mod zero, if I, if, no, at mod four, if I go nowhere, at mod five, I start over. With mod five yeah. is zero, I start over. So with the length of the vector. Right, right. So here at mod, so what do I know? At mod five, with mod five equals zero, I 
right, so let's go here. Let's Odd length of vector equals zero starts with hope. When it equals one, This is this. Send me an email. Let me work on this. All right, I'll, I'll help you. I'll try to open the pattern as well. Yeah, but that's there. That's where okay, it starts. Yeah, that's where it starts. Now the question is, you have to be able to. Uh, now we're not. Yeah, right. We can see it. Mm -hmm. So now we're in, we're between sketching a solution yeah. and an algorithm. Yeah, let me let me send me an email, sure, and then I'll I'll, I'll help you work on this. Let me give him his, his name. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, Thank you. I'm a little bit confused and confused, like wild versus wild. I know you said wild, like you know, logical. Like, 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 right. So. I usually use a while when I don't know or don't care to figure out how many times I can go to the loop, right? That when my algorithm says, I'm going to stop based on some condition, right? I'm not going to stop based off after X number of iterations. I'm going to stop based off some condition. Something's going to go false. Like I'm going to hit the end of a vector. That's a point. Yeah, that's a while. Because oh, remember, the while allows you to check for a condition. A for loop is just going to execute, it's just going to go down the loop vector and assign that to the loop variable. And then when it's done, it's done. Right. So a for loop is a little bit more narrow-minded in the sense that it's it's just going to go down the loop vector and assign that to the loop variable each time. That's all it's going to do. Right? Whereas a while loop is, okay, every time I come back to the, the beginning of the loop, I'm asking, is this condition still true? Right. So you have to have a condition. You have to have some kind of condition, right? The condition for a while, yes, that's the thing with a while loop. Me doing the loop again is dependent on some condition, as opposed to I'm just going to automatically do the loop again until I finish out this vector, okay. right? That's the difference. A for loop is going to finish out. It's going to try to finish out the vector unless you put a break in there. Don't do that, right? <laughs> a for loop is going to just try to finish out the vector, right? Regardless. Whereas a while loop is like, is this condition still true? Yes, it is. Okay, I'll do it. Right? And that's how wild, well, that's the difference. That's the difference. And so now what you have to do is, there's some algorithms that can be done with both. In fact, there's a large number of algorithms that can be done with both. It just depends on how you think about the problem. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like when I was doing the string thing, I didn't necessarily know how many words were in the string. And I didn't care to figure it out. I could have figured it out and made it for a loop. But why not just get each token until the string's empty and then I'm done, right? So that's my condition, right? Is when the string's empty and I'm done. Yeah. As opposed to if I'm going to look at every character in a string, 
well, I'll just pull off each character as I go, and the for loop will do that because I set that equal to the string, and it's going to pull off every character. In there. So I don't have to. I don't have a condition. I'm going to look at every character in the string. There really is no condition, yeah. right? So that's that's sort of the difference, right? It make sense. Yeah. I just need to look over it. And you have to you have to do enough problems to, and then some of it is some of it is is very Bob Ross like. You just look at it and be like, okay. I'll do a full loop here. Mm -hmm. Why? Because uh, I feel like it. Right? <laughs> I mean, and sometimes, see, I, I tend to go the for loop route. That's my base. And then I use a while if I have to. Right? But you get into some coding situations where while is the thing mm -hmm. to do because everything's a condition. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a matter of it's experience. That's all. Yeah. There, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're okay. I had a question. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know if it's the way I did the string is I have a particular. Well, I can tell you. Yeah, I can tell you. Oh, yeah. What's your output on those? I can show you the outputs, but I can show you the test case. So I, I did get. Um, you did put it out. It's here. It's well, literally the same. Well, for those, but for the ones you got wrong, yeah, test three, four. Are the same as those, or they're different? But there's only three. There's three here, yeah. but when we test them here, we do additional tests. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah, let me show you what those tests are, and that might help you figure okay. out what your answer is. The problem is that it's five level two can faster. Work faster. So the other tests are not included in the exam. Right. The, okay. Yeah. These are these. This okay. keeps from hard coding, right? Oh, okay. Um. So this is first one is height seventy two, cut off one eighty two. Get that one right. The next one is 73. Right. Cut off one of the two All right, so number three is 67. Cut off 182.8. So you might want to see your code on 67. Right, and then test four is zero. No, no problem. Yeah, here, take it out. Test three. And then test five, you get right. And that, oh, that's just the, yeah, the, checking, the checking. All right. So give that a try and okay. see if that works. Okay. Thank right. you so much. You're welcome. Close that. Close that. Close that. Close that. Close that. Oh, wow. It's crazy. 